Hello, movie lovers. Welcome home. My name is Amy Henserling, and you're listening to Watch This List Unplugged. This is my fourth episode of Amy's Progress, and I have chosen something for Horror Month uh, to sort of kick us off. It's a movie that has uh, strong religious um, overtones, underpinnings, that um, my guest also is a big fan of and has extensive knowledge and experience. Watching um, my buddy Darren uh, is here with me today. Darren, I'm so stoked to uh, have you on the show. Say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. I mean, I am very excited to be here. This is one of my favorite films, and I've seen it so many times. So any opportunity to talk about it, I'm always up for. Yeah, and we, I kind of, uh, uh, Darren, I unusually stumbled upon because normally I just have guests that I've been connected to for a long time on Letterboxd, but I just so happened to be reading uh, random reviews of a movie that I couldn't stand, <laughs> The Lost Daughter, and I came across Darren's review and it completely opened my eyes in a in a totally different way. And I thought, I have to comment to this guy. And then Darren wrote back. Which was really gracious because he's uh, a very popular Elbeer. So that was really an honor to me. And then we started chatting. I mean, I'm, I mean, my view on this has always been like, it's always worth replying. It's always worth contacting people and, and talking to people because, you know, people want to have that conversation. And I'm, I love talking about film and analyzing film and discovering those perspectives anyway. Right. Spe- you know, and as- you're somebody who engages you know, on, on the platform. A yeah, lot. Pro- probably too much, but yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, but it's good because you, you have people engaging with you who are, who you said like, uh, like, it'll make you think like, Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't consider this perspective. And just that, that uh, willingness to do with strangers is kind of nice. Yeah, and the thing is, when they're being you, thoughtful. Yeah, and if you if you, if you write thoughtful content and people respond thoughtfully, I think that's really just a harmonious way of interacting. And people do have so many interesting views. Like, I don't agree with everything I read, but I think um, there are so many views that I would never see if I wasn't on Letterbox and I wasn't you know talking with people and I wasn't like exposing myself to those kind of opinions, whether it be political opinions or just mm. like artistic opinions like you don't see it if you don't engage with it um and and yeah that's what i love about letterbox and just film discussion in general if you're in like the right space i agree and that's what we're going to try to do today so so i i have told darren that the way that um we're gonna structure this today is uh, we're getting into the Wicker Man, uh, the 1973 horror classic, um, and Darren is going to sort of set us up and ease us in uh, to uh, this uh, little island paradise <laughs> um, with some context and some <laughs> plot. And then uh, the second half of this is going to be what. Amy learned what I learned from the Wicker Man, how much I loved it. And then we're going to get into sort of the nitty gritty of uh, what I think it's saying. So Darren, kick us off uh, with uh, some plot and some context. Okay. So the plot of the Wicker Man on the most basic level is a Scottish police officer has been told that there's a girl missing on an island. He's a devout Christian police officer and he goes to this island off the coast of Scotland, which is very remote. Um, far from the mainland and he goes to investigate this missing girl and when he gets there um, he discovers that no one knows who she is and he also discovers that the island is pagan and that the people on that island worship gods that predate Christianity and the context of the film is like twofold there's that there's the context of horror cinema and where it sits and there's a context of like history and where it sits in British history so to go through like so I'll just go through one of these first and then and we can talk about it. But to go through like the um to go through like the the side of it that comes from history. Um Britain has always been a Christian country. Or it has been since like, like two thousand years or so. But in the twentieth century, 
Christianity was on the decline um, generally. And in the post-war era, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, Christianity was increasingly um, going away. And in the 1960s, you get these very liberal reforms that come into place in Britain um, across the board. You get, um, you know, you, you get new legislation equivalent to civil rights legislation in the USA. We have the Race Relations Act and we have um, legalization of homosexuality and all these things in Britain. And, secu- and secular culture kind of rises. And you also have, you know, the the culture that you get in London, like the swinging 60s, the sexually liberal and free young people who don't follow traditional Christian values. And this isn't just Britain, this is just all of Northern Europe. There's an increase in secularization, which has continued to this day, and Northern Europe remains some of the most secular parts of the world. And so The Wicker Man is about a man who is devoutly Christian, who is committed to Christian values, entering a society that is opposed to them, or at the very least doesn't believe in them. And it's about, in that sense, as Anthony Schaefer, the screenwriter of The Wicker Man, kind of pondered, it's about what use is religion if you believe it, but the world around you doesn't? Like, how much does that give you mm-hmm. to get through, you know, day to day? Like, like, does that actually provide enough? Or are you facing an uphill struggle that ends in The Wicker Man quite horrifically? Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, so there's just so much to unpack there. Okay, so so if you come at this from like uh, the horror context, right, with Christopher Lee and why mm. they want to make this project, you were telling me that uh, when we were talking before, uh, when we first met, that it's a bit subversive, right? Yes. What they were trying to do. Like it was, okay, can you talk a little bit to that? Like what you feel they were both – in reaction to, but what they personally felt compelled mm-hmm. to express that makes this sort of unique in context. Yes. So alongside this secularization of Britain, this political change, there's also the horror genre. Mm. So in 1957, Hammer releases, Hammer Studios is the most famous British horror film studio. And to this day, it probably still is. It's like the one that is always held up as like the high point of British horror. Um, in 1957, they released their first big hit, which is The Curse of Frankenstein, starring Christopher Lee as the monster. And this was itself very liberal minded. It was bloody and gory in a way that films prior to that were not. And it started a whole trend. It inspired uh, Mario Bava, who went on to you know, kickstart Jallo. It, you know, it inspired um, a yes. decade of British horror with Christopher Lee at the centre. But the thing about those films is whilst they were... A young, aimed at a young audience and they were more had more sex and violence than previous films from Britain. So they were liberal minded. They were also quite conservative. Like the mindset of the Hammer films is very much Christianity wins the day. You see this in the early Dracula films where Dracula is repeatedly defeated by a cross. Um, the best one is The Brides of Dracula, where um, it's the shadow of a cross formed from two buildings that actually kills the vampire. And you get that throughout Hammer. You get a sense of Britishness and British characters win and the bad guys are exotic or not Christian and not British. And that's kind of the trend throughout their films. You get films like The Devil Rides Out, which stars Christopher Lee and was a Christopher Lee passion project at Hammer Studios. And that film is about dark magic. And once again, the devil loses and Christianity wins. So The Wicker Man comes along in the early 70s And Anthony Schaefer described The Wicker Man as being like an attempt to make a film that's intelligent as opposed to what Hammer and Amicus Studios and the other British horror studios were doing. And the point of The Wicker Man in that sense is to subvert the idea of the Christian hero going in and saving the day. Because taking spoilers right out of this, the Christian loses in The Wicker Man. Mm -hmm. The Christian dies in the end. He burns to death. And... That in that in and of itself is subversive because that was not the norm of British horror cinema. It was about Christianity and Britishness persevering. And another thing is, you know, Hammer Studios, the the villains were um, were often foreign. They were often, um, you know, from from continental Europe or they were from Asia. They were not British. In The Wicker Man, the villains are both British and they are not defeated by Christianity. 
which is a very big subversion of what Hammer were doing and was a conscious subversion by the screenwriter Anthony Schaefer and um, Robin Hardy, the director. And Christopher Lee um, loved the screenplay. He was a big advocate for the screenplay. He got The Wicker Man made. And he didn't take a salary for this. He did it for free, essentially. Or so he, he's claimed. I don't know how true that is. Um, because he yeah. read the screenplay and thought this is, you know, this, this is this is because he was personally, at that point in his career, he wasn't very happy with the quality of horror films that he was being offered by Hammer and by equivalent studios in Britain. Um, some of the films he refused to even read the dialogue from. Infamously, there's one Dracula film where he says zero lines at all because he refused to read it. Um, and so by this point, he was looking for something better, more intelligent. This screenplay came his way and he thought, this is it. This is a more intelligent horror film. And it was because it, it, it attacked the very establishment that his previous films had kind of sought to uphold. Yeah, I think, I think what, so I just have so many thoughts. So the Christopher Lee part of this is almost like just total irony, right? Mm -hmm. That, that, I mean, I feel like that's what gives this besides him and Edward Woodward, which is the best name ever, by the way. I love that name, Edward Woodward. Um, So (laughs) um, having that, having the two of them sort of represent uh, those sides, Mm -hmm. right? That you have the heathen pagan as Lee, and then you have Sergeant Howie, who is the pious Christian, the devout yeah. Catholic, you know, and then um, to have to have it structured in that sort of um, typical horror fashion. It reminded me of like um, Messiah of Evil and In the Mouth of Madness, you know, Stranger Comes to Town uh, sort of thing where. Uh, and then have like the the island itself be very British, yeah. Uh, um, but but uh, British in a sort of like storybook way mm-hmm. that almost renders it unbelievable. Uh, you know, with the songs and the Britishness of it being so over the top that you're actually unsettled by it. Yeah, uh, I think was a genius stroke too. Um, and then to have the Christian basically repeatedly lose. Yeah. You know, like he, he can't win no matter what scene he's in. Like he basically loses the entire yes. time until he actually loses at the very end. Yeah. Every battle he does. So he's outsmarted. Exactly. Yes. And then um, to have him be so immovable anyway, Mm-hmm. Uh, I think is also a reaction to perhaps, and you can tell me what you think about this, the reaction to people who were starting to veer away from Christianity, we're seeing it, the, seeing it as almost like tyrannical or, or like oppressive, like the, the, the strength of Howie coming at you to an unwelcome person who doesn't who isn't interested is so clear in this. Yeah. I mean, like th- there's many ways to look at it, but one way to look at it is that to some extent, how he kind of naively brings it on himself because even because he goes into this place and he completely doesn't accept their way of living. And he's so stubborn in his mindset to the very end. And, but that's precisely why they want to kill him. So the other side of this is look, this look at this the other way and say, you know, it's you know, it's you know, the death of Christianity is represented by a hero dying, but how he isn't a perfect hero by any means. He does he absolutely refuses to accept there's any way of living kind of aside from his way of living. He's he has lines about, you know, this is a Christian country, what you're teaching is immoral, what you're teaching is wrong. And he objects to everything he sees, even however slight, however small. Um and you know, and, and in the end it brings him nothing. And, I, and part of the film, in some sense, is, well, if the world is changing, you know, like, how, how is, there, is there much worth in being stubborn? But then the vice to this, the vice versa to mm-hmm. this, is that actually is the island itself is just as tyrannical, perhaps, as um, a very strongly Christian yes. country may be. 
Um, Lord Summer Isle, played by Christopher Lee, who's like the leader of the pagans, he has this grand speech about how his grandfather, his father and his grandfather introduced paganism to the island in order to win the islanders over and get them to help collect the crops and things. So basically, you know, it's not that there's a real rooted belief in paganism from the top down. It's a tool of power. And that could just as well apply to Christianity in the sense that his relatives before that used Christianity. Um, you know, it was just something that exists in society and a one man goes through it completely against it, completely against any alternative way of living. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, a, another great section in the film is he points out some stuff that's completely absurd in the pagan beliefs. And then someone says, well, you know, yes. G- G- Jesus is like, you know, like, um, you know, born from a virgin mother who was impregnated by a ghost. Virgin impregnated by a ghost. It's like, you know, like, like, how's that any more logical than believing putting a frog in your mouth will cure you of an illness? Correct. I was going to say, so uh, one of the things that really struck me, really mm-hmm. struck me and sort of like I paused when I heard that line. That particular line that Chris, so Chris, there's a scene where Christopher Lee meets with Howie at last. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic scene because yeah. it's so funny, the way that Lee, uh, his demeanor and the way he is. Um, but he says something that line, where um, Howie is interacting with this person, as though Christianity were not perceived by an outsider as ludicrous and i think there's something to that where it's like when christians are trying to convert people but they're not taking into account that to someone who doesn't believe they look just as crazy Mm -hmm. as these people on that island there's a delusion there because he's like okay but yeah jesus was born of a virgin impregnated by a ghost and it was like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, like mm-hmm. it, 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 it looks like a cult to somebody who isn't yes. on your page, man, you know, and, and for Howie not to see that, I think is very, um, very representative of our culture now, like that people can't see that what they're saying seems crazy to somebody who doesn't believe what they're saying is really, really profound. That's a very profound point, I think. Yeah, and I think that's like the entire point of the film. It's it's about that craziness. It's about it's about seeing people who you think are crazy, but actually, who is crazy here? Um, you know, because they both. I mean, I mean, how both Howie and the pagans make sacrifices, right? Like the pagan sacrifices are mm-hmm. literally murderous. But how he lives his life, like <laughs> very devoutly, he never consummates his marriage. He complete he he spends his entire life, um, you know, like doing things um, that are way beyond the average police officer. There there are scenes that are in the that have been deleted from the final cut and the theatrical cut, which show him prior to leaving the island in more detail than is in the final cut. And in and th- there was originally in the script a much bigger emphasis on Howie being a completely unreasonable police officer who would go and shut down pubs for people being too loud and being completely puritanical. And they turned that down in the final version, but th- that was originally planned that they would em- they would emphasize that more. And I think like there's a, there is an element of he makes his sacrifices for nothing, they make their sacrifices for nothing, but the difference is that their sacrifices require killing him. But the broad point is you do things for religion. It's not enough to save you, nor is it rational. Um, because if you want to, you're not living your life based on what you, what is actually true or you understand to be true. You're living your life based on what someone has told you to do. And that, and that involves incredible harm socially or spiritually well now i was gonna say too another there's there's two differences that i see um Mm. between uh the way that they're portrayed so the the first one is that as much as you said like that it's a tool for power in both instances that they can be abused in that way there's um at least with the pagans 
um, there is a practical element because they do believe that their harvests are affected or not affected. So that there is um, mm -hmm. um, a rhyme to the a reason to the madness, you know, like, yeah. you know, there's there's it makes a little bit of rational sense if you believed that your harvest was down because it needed a sacrifice then well of course you would make one and then you would justify uh murder yeah i mean basically because you're trying to reach a practical end so th so there's one thing and then also um what what really struck me too um which i think is applicable to us in a larger context is christopher lee is not trying at all, nor is anybody on the island, trying to convince Howie uh, of the rightness of what they believe. Yeah. They don't care. Uh, meanwhile, he is trying very hard to preach and convert and be like, you can't be teaching this in your classroom, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And so, um, and they're like, you know, kind of unfazed, but they also just aren't militant. When, when Lee's talking to him, he's not offended by his belief, nor is he trying to really do anything about it and so um that is also a fascinating reaction to me because it's like if if you believe something but you can be hands off about whether or not somebody agrees with you yeah. to me that's a strength and they're showing that how howie's weakness primarily is that even if he had the answer and let's say that he's right he is making it impossible to reach anyone in any real way. Yeah, I mean, so towards the end of the film, when they're um, stripping him down for the to burn him to death, they say something. They have, they have this entire speech about the best kind of sacrifice is the right kind of adult, and how right and, kind of per adult. Per, yes, and how he is the right kind of adult because he is so stubborn. He his Christianity is so strong, and he will and he will in no way accept anything else. Whereas other people might be reasonable, they might listen. They might also say, "Look, I'm a Christian, but I'm willing to, you know, not stick, not not live my life so purely. I'm willing to, you know, um, commit to, to commit sins on occasion, however minor." Um, and so mm -hmm. the I, you know, you know, whether that be even something like sex outside marriage, which Howie refuses to do, like things like that, which um, mm -hmm. because Howie is so Christian he will completely naively fall into their trap. He is the right kind of adult for them. He's so pure and he's so against them. But on the practical point that you mentioned first about they want to bring that back, back the harvest, from the perspective of the villagers, that's the practical mm -hmm. point. But part of the subversion, I think, as well, is Christopher Lee has a speech about, um, about how the religion was introduced to, to, to encourage the people on the island to help his family um, look after the harvest of apples. And it's never failed them until the year before Howie arrives. So that, to me, is part of the, well, okay, so it's the villagers think it's practical. But in reality, behind the scenes, it's actually practical, not for them, but for the people who own the land and the people who employ them. It's actually them who have actually instigated and, and artificially created this religion on the island in order to control the populace. And that's part of the, I think, cynicism mm -hmm. of religion that the film kind of generally has. Um, and, and, and so there's also, I just think, a general ambiguity. Does Christopher Lee, and a character Lord Summersile, does he believe in anything that he talks about in the film? Does he believe in the religion? Because mm -hmm. he has all the power. And um, he's a smart guy and, you know, do, like, does like does he believe it or is it a useful tool for him? And the film never makes it clear one way or the other, but I've always read it as he's cynically using it. But I, but I, but people definitely may interpret that the other way. Okay. So, so it would be like, so, so he's basically using it for political gain. Yeah manipulating the system and then and then acting like you know he accepts it and then the people in order to cope with their actions right mm -hmm. would have to actually believe yes or have faith in or in order to justify the wrongness 
yeah. of the situation. Yeah. And I, and I think that, much like people do for in cults. Yes. I mean, that's what the cult mentality does, right? They're the people at the top are typically the ones who are like, this is mumbo jumbo, but it's a way to mind control. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, that's, that's how I've always seen the Wicker Man in, in through that lens. But in some ways it's scarier if he is mm-hmm. a true believer and they're all a collective kind of hive mind cult. But the other angle and perhaps more practical angle is it's a cult led by a cult leader and that cult leader um, is manipulating events. Right. Right. Okay. So one of the things that I, that I wrote down um, about religious extremism and just thinking about how they're represented was that it kills and it'll get you killed. Yeah. Uh, that was my first sort of impression that w- was that, um, and, and that's sort of the way that I think any time that things just run amok and go, I mean, you could talk about like Hitler and Nazi Germany. Yeah. I mean, any time an, a, an ideology or someone just goes haywire onto one side, um, it's destructive and violent, right? Yeah. But if you take this down to sort of a micro level, uh, I was thinking about how there are things in like our lives uh, that where you could be in situations where people who think they have the right answer to something tend to have an attitude of militancy, like Mm anti-vaxxers or people, people actually, it could be anti-vaxxers or people who believe in vaccines. I'm going to say both because um, it could be either one yeah. or um, politically uh, conservatives and Democrats in America or um, just just any stance that people take. CrossFit, working out, uh, people who are vegetarians versus people who eat meat. You can literally take any subject yeah. that that someone has an opinion about and then when you feel – and and you could feel this sincerely with the best intentions that you are right, like like in yeah. the right. It's very difficult for people to temper themselves. I'm curious from your perspective. If you feel that you know the right answer to something and you have a conviction about it, what is the best or most effective way of winning people over or speaking in such a way that somebody would even want to contemplate a different way than what they might believe. Okay. So my, my thing on this is I don't think I can know what it is, what is ultimately the best thing for everybody. All I can know is what I think Mm -hmm. my personal morals are and what I think is right and wrong. And I wouldn't go out there and say to someone else, your, your morals are inherently right or wrong. It would have to be a case of explaining what I think is right and wrong and making my case for myself. I think I think if you go out there and say you're wrong straight away, you are losing people. You need to as mm-hmm. you, you need to at the very you need to because you know just just that negative reinforcement instantly just you know they're not interested at that point. It's it's about um, telling people um, things that are more. Think things that they can listen to and understand, and they might change their minds if they hear you out. I mean, here's an example. You mentioned vegetarianism. Um, I'm a vegan, and I've been vegan yeah. for um, just over eight years now. And before I went vegan, I was like, well, to me, this seems like a really nice idea, but I can't imagine there's any... I imagine it's just a really difficult way of living your life. And then I lived with someone for a year who was vegan, like he was a housemate, and... I was like, oh, it's actually very easy. And he basically won me over because he was like, look, if you're interested, it's not that difficult. And, you know, and he didn't care or he didn't like everyone else in the house in ate meat and he didn't judge. He didn't like make a big deal out of it. And since then, I've always been like on that position. And I find it slightly annoying when other vegans and vegetarians are very militant about it, because I always think the way to get people to agree with us on this issue is to just show them, hey, like it's an easy, it's an easier lifestyle choice. It has these benefits, and leave it at that. And if someone says I'm not interested, then 
that's up to them. Like we will, you know, you will win people over by winning their hearts, their hearts and minds, not just by telling them or berating, telling them they're wrong or berating them or, you know, like that's, I don't think ultimately that makes much difference. If you want to make people, if you want to make people change their minds as in actually change their minds, not just force it through law, force them to change, actually make them believe the message you want them to believe. Um, it requires more than just telling people they're wrong. And I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is, um, I, and I, and I would almost say like when you were talking about Howie being so Christian that he is repelling, I think the point of this film, or at least it's, it's, it's communicating to me is that he actually isn't Christian at all. Um, to a certain extent, because the way it like if you think about even like Scorsese's version mm-hmm. of Last Temptation, which I just recently saw, Christ did not behave this way. Yeah, that like if you if you t- even if you don't believe that he was the Son of God, let's just say Jesus as yeah. described as a person, he did not behave uh, with condemnation. Uh, he wasn't judgmental about who he hung out with. He was around. Um, people who were poor and uh, prostitutes, tax collectors, people who were shunned by society, Mm -hmm. people who were outsiders. So the way that Christianity morphed through time and evolved, that is actually so anti-Christ and not Christ-like, and then professes that they are living in the name of that, I think is where this gets so dangerous because then people associate that spirit with Christianity because that's what it's become, right? So like you're saying, the tragedy of this movie, and it shows it so brilliantly, is that Howie, as as sincere as he is, and I believe that he is as a character, his martyrdom or, you know, his death has no meaning at all uh, because his inability to convey passion in a way that that was um, enticing or attractive or uplifting or life affirming was impossible. He he couldn't take the passion he felt and communicate it in such a way that anybody would be like like your your housemate did. Your housemate made it was so um, genuine with what he was doing and didn't force it upon you so that you were like, oh, I wonder what this guy's doing. I wonder if I would benefit from this. Look at this guy's life. I kind of want to be like this guy. And then you naturally came about it yourself. And if you hadn't, it would have been fine. That to me is the way to emulate any sort of rightness or thing that you feel personally about. And this movie shows the flip of that. If you aren't able to do that, it really causes so much destruction. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, like how it is sincere, but he cannot convince a single villager to help him. Not a single one comes to his side in the entire film. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, I mean, I mean, right. I mean, and, and, you know, you could interpret that as they're all evil or you can interpret that as they're all, they all believe their religion and you can't go in there and convince someone to switch to your religion in the way he he does. Mm. You know, it you know it it would take a lot. A, it would take more thought, more care, and it would take um, someone who isn't so determined that there is only one way for society to function, because that is how how his viewpoint essentially. Right. There's a severe lack of humility and a severe lack of openness, like open mindedness at all. Yeah. To to, and it's also that both sides are so closed off that even if there was any benefit that anybody could find in either one, they're so unwilling. Because as much as he is like, you know, closed off, they're closed off to him completely as yeah. well. They're just nicer about it. Yeah, and and they're a literal. They're just more. Yeah. They're a literal island. They're 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 literally detached from the men and, and they want to be detached. They literally want to live in their own little cult 
and never ever interact with people aside from in this instance where they need somebody to sacrifice and that's you know and, and like they are as close-minded as him in many ways um and and they are as determined as him to keep their religion um but they haven't but but they but how he is on their turf they're not on his turf he has gone to their place and told them mm. what to do whereas you know as much as they are close minded you know like being close minded in their own little bubble is different to going into someone else's bubble and trying to make that bubble be part of yours yep and that's where i was thinking of him as like a missionary in a way, but except he's coming into just a completely unwelcome territory. It, it, you know, it's like uh, <laughs> you're, you're going into a realm where they are not, they don't think they need your help. Uh, and they're not suffering in the way that that would be receptive to any different point of view at all. Yeah. I mean, I mean, th there's a great scene in the school where Howie uh, makes a point of, well, it all comes from here. The reason the teenagers and the adults on this island believe this religion is because it's st they're indoctrinated from a very young age. And that is part of the problem this island has, right, is that they're, in that they're raised to believe in this cult from a very young age. And that cocoons them in that and they cannot escape it um, throughout their entire life. Um and so that becomes um, part of the problem. Right. Okay, so sh shifting gears a little bit here, how do you feel about, like, the technical aspects of this movie? How do you feel about the music? How do you feel about the direction? Like, if, you're, if we're talking about yeah. just as, as a s sort of cinematic experience apart from its deeper underpinnings, which uh, I, think the, I think the depth of it is what makes it mm -hmm. effective horror, I, I always feel this way. Horror is slowly sort of becoming a genre that I have a, a great deal of uh, affection for and respect because when it works, um, I, I don't know, it just reaches on such a, such a powerful level that I don't feel just straight drama does because there is a lot of truth here uh, that, that, that can be applied. Um, but, but aside, putting that aside for now, how does it work as a horror film in your opinion? So, Okay, so two questions. As a, as a horror film, I think because of the depth of it, because of the sheer horror that Howie ends up facing, because he literally burns to death in what I think is a genuinely terrifying ending, I think it's an effective horror film. Mm -hmm. But there is no denying the fact that it's cheap looking. It's The dubbing is pretty bad. Um, the cinematography whilst perfectly nice and there is plenty of beautiful shots in the film is often a little perfunctory the editing is a bit muddled i would say it's it, it is the work of a first time director i think and i think that kind of shows um it's worth noting as well that they were forced to put this film together at the last minute um because they have this script and the studio got bought out by um, american investors and it was meant to be um shot in like the spring but they were like no no we need to prove that we're still making films and we aren't just going to like sell you know sell the company and strip its assets so they put it in turn around instantly which meant they filmed it in like autumn time so even though it's because of the specific folklore it draws on it's meant to be spring it isn't it's filmed in like the autumn and winter and it's very very cold and you can see that they had to put fake blossom on the trees the actors aren't all scottish so plenty, <laughs> so plenty of them had to dub. Um, there's the the infamous dance sequence has these incredible. There's infamous dance sequence where Britt Eklund, um, the Swedish actress who is dubbed throughout the entire film because she's not Scottish, um, has this nude dance sequence <laughs> which they just cut to a body double in like half mm -hmm. of it, and it's so obviously not her, and it's so crudely done. Um, it's not technically a masterpiece by any stretch, but it has a lot of ideas and heart and spirit and that's what i like about it. like i can live with the fact that it's a bit shoddy that the sound you can hear some very obvious dubbing you can hear some adr work and and stuff that's very not 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 in line with the film and you can tell that uh, the footage isn't all the highest quality um but 
it's the script. The script is what makes this film so great. Um, and the execution does is does a solid job um, given the limitations they had. But by, but if you, I mean, to compare this film, for example, same company, 1973, British Lion made Wickham and they also made Don't Look Now, the uh, Nicholas Rogue movie. Oh, wow. Right. And it was, and yeah, Rogue. right. And you look at how technically perfect that film is, how every edit, every shot in that film is on, is, is like at the highest level of, of craftsmanship from a filmmaking point of view. It is the complete opposite to the Wicker Man in terms of quality of the filmmaking in, in some ways, because one is very smooth and perfect and one is very broken and kind of cobbled together. But, the, but they're both masterpieces because the Wicker Man script is so strong. But, you know, and the fun trivia fact that people sometimes throw out is on the re-release of the Wicker Man, it was the B movie to Don't Look Now in Britain. So people would go and see both. And at the time... <laughs> No one knew that both films were going to be classics. And of course they are major staples now. Yeah. I mean, bo- both of them, I, I, yeah, if you are familiar at all, then you would know both. Yes. And th- I mean, this Don't Look Now I saw quite a long time ago just because it, because it had Sutherland and Christie in it, mm-hmm. and I was familiar with um, Rogue, yeah. um, who was just – so it's such a like has such an eye um and um but wicker man i had just seen because of for the, for this episode and i didn't know anything about it that was another really nice thing was just going in completely cold yeah. and not knowing how it was going to end um i had a feeling <laughs> just because the wicker man didn't show up for so long yes. uh that <laughs> we were moving towards something and I have to say, I almost entirely regret the fact that I've seen Midsummer uh, yes. because it was such a rip mm-hmm. uh, off of this in in such a like yeah blatant way. Yeah, I mean, it, The Wicker Man is is very influential, ironically, but it's never quite been repeated. And I think it's because of the circumstances. I mean, they remade The Wicker Man with Nicolas Cage infamously, which is a terrible film. Um, regardless of how how good it is, I can't imagine. Uh, yeah, even just not being even even if it wasn't a remake, it's just a terrible film. Full stop. It's really really bad. Um, but the thing about right. but part of what makes a Wicker Man work is its charm. Because the other thing is, as much as it is a low budget stuff, it's very very well researched. Anthony Schaefer, the screenwriter, spent months reading about genuine um, old mythology in Britain and genuine Celtic folklore. So all of the like um, symbolism and the things that are mentioned derive from genuine British religion prior to Christianity. The Wicker Man is inspired by genuine stories, although there's no evidence that they ever actually burnt a person inside them. But they would build men, uh, like wooden men, and burn them, and things like this. So there's this whole. Um, it has a genuine sense to it, even though it's an authenticity. That's it. It has a grit and an authenticity. And the music throughout the film is written by genuine folk music artists, and it's gen- and you know like like it genuinely does all derive from this from things that are real and things and so it creates a sense of a real community that other films haven't quite managed to do because they're inspired by the Wicker Man and they're transposing it to a new setting or a new place and you can't quite capture the authenticity of the original because the original is so well researched which is ironic because that's it's like the film the film is able to produce a feeling that the characters aren't Mm -hmm. it's almost like you know the 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 thing that the movie is about is that inability to reach uh your intended audience and then the film is so masterfully and um, almost like lovingly <laughs> uh, created in such a way that we can feel that even though no character in the film sort of expresses that, if that makes any sense. It's like the medium itself almost accomplishes the goal that the characters can't in a way. Yeah, I think... I, th- I think the film builds a world that 
each individual moment doesn't necessarily do. Um, but as a whole, because of how it right. merges, because the music is constant, because of the because the references all tie in together so well, and because the script is so interconnected and, and detailed and, and like and very intricate, I think that ultimately elevates the fact that individual bits of the film don't quite work and can't quite capture the um like like you feel like you have entered a truly pagan world when you watch the wicker man even though in certain scenes you just go i don't mm-hmm. believe that's happening but because of how it's shot because it, it, you know the cuts are awkward i don't believe that scene but you believe the world around it do you do you are you a fan of blair witch project i am I'm not as I'm not like you, John, the Blair Witch Project, but I, I do like it. That's one. That's one that's coming to my mind. I don't know if you have if you if you can think right now of different examples, but how you're describing this, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Where when I watched Blair Witch Project, which was uh, I watched it for the first time last year, uh, there were parts of it that did not work. Mm-hmm. Where um, I'd be like, "Well, that looks fake," or "That looks wh- whatever." But the overall ambiance and the way that it was done was very effective. Um, and I could feel the commitment of the filmmakers to what they were doing. Like it, you, whatever you want to say about it production quality wise, I think that, that it's the reason it was so popular is because it is coming from that same sort of honest um, trying to get at something yeah. place where there's just no artifice. They really, whether they did it or not effectively is subjective. Yes. But I think the intention is pure. Yeah. and Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think the Blair Witch Project actually is a good parallel because the thing about the Blair Witch Project is it's that thing of, okay, there's obviously someone just outside moving the tent. So it's not actually that scary when you think about it, but you completely, uh, but yes. you completely believe it. And right. because of the way it's done and because of how innovative it Correct. was. You, and I mean, another, I mean, an example that, I would maybe throw this as well is something like uh, Romero's Night of the Living Dead, which, you know, you look at the zombies in that living mm-hmm. dead and it's just a guy pulling the face and walking slowly. Like you don't, you don't look at that and go, that's really terrifying. But in the context of, of Night of the Living Dead, which is so claustrophobic and intense, you totally buy into it. And the, whatever qualities that, whatever cheapness that film has is completely negated by the strength of the atmosphere. And the Wicker Man is in that same vein. It's the atmosphere and authenticity. It's not necessarily um, the nicest film studio in the world with the best production values. That's why I thought of Blair Witch because it, because there's also things where, you know, it, there's also the whole area of horror where it's like the practical effects, mm. the special effects, the, the things that are unsettling about it is how well done uh, something is yeah. right and how realistic and uh, tactile and tangible something is but I think for something like this it doesn't bother me in the slightest that it's low budget no. because uh, they managed to create an unsettling genuinely frightening atmosphere just by what's being suggested uh, I feel this way in um Exorcist three, especially with the, with Legion, mm. uh, where the way that he comes across and he's just sitting there talking. Cure is another one that comes to mind where people are just talking yeah. and you're like deeply afraid, and they're just like sitting there having a conversation. Yeah, I think Cure is one of the like probably ten scariest films I've ever seen. And it's mostly people mm-hmm. talking, but it genuinely scares me so much just thinking about what that, me too. what that film is doing and what it's about. Yes. Yes. It's unnerving just through dialogue. Yeah. And I think that um, you're they're tapping into something uh, that sort of transcends... Rosemary's Baby comes to mind too, because that's all dialogue largely there's events in Mm -hmm. it that are terrifying and they're really well done because they're so scary but it is largely talking and someone someone slowly going nuts uh because of surroundings encroaching and um i just think that wicker man is such a 
phenomenal example of getting under our skin in this way that's beyond sort of the limitations of film almost yeah no yeah completely i think it's def- i think it's a film that gets you not so much in the brain it gets you in the like heart because you are it, it, as in it it terrifies you it doesn't you know you know it isn't quite making sense but it completely gets you and you are completely immersed and you completely fall for it and that's this and that's the strength of its filmmaking um and whether or not that is because of or in spite of the limitations you know that is it 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 works regardless right you we also have to mention before we go that uh you were talking about hot fuzz <laughs> Uh, so I I want to give a shout out to because uh, <laughs> you said Edward Woodward is and it does a cameo in that right and that's sort of a riff just like Midsummer but in a different way yeah I mean I mean I mean hot hot, hot fuzz is that thing if a police officer goes to a town and they don't and th- there's mysterious things going on and then played for last but Edward Woodward is on the is on the <laughs> side of the bad guys this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. which i'm sure was so much fun for them oh yeah i mean yeah. i mean edgar wright from what i understand <laughs> is a big fan of the wicker man and he definitely i mean that's definitely why edward woodward is there um because you know he's deliberate homage right right yeah <laughs> right. right edgar wright and well and the i mean uh i didn't like uh soho but i mean i think that was also sort of a giallo um homage too as well as just <laughs> him him doing all of his influences yeah i mean he loves those genre stuff from the 70s and and 60s um and yeah i don't always think they're effective Mm -hmm. but yeah like he he loves those films right in in a way that he's really passionate about yeah um you know like he's done a romero yeah nod he's done a wicker man ripoff he's done a jello ripoff um don't think what else what should he do next Uh that's like um he he uh yeah what should he do next I was about to say yeah. spaghetti western, but he's already he already did a spaghetti western rip off before he made uh, Shaun of the Dead. He did like uh, one as a like as a very, when he was very young. He made a film called A Fistful of Fingers, which is a um a, 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 a like when he, he shot it with his <laughs> friends, and it's a like a spoof of, of spaghetti westerns. Yeah, fistful of dollars. Uh, well, fist yeah yeah yeah. So yeah. So, uh, Darren, where, how does this, uh, how does Wicker Man rank for you? Like if, if you're, if we're talking about, um, sort of, uh, this, this genre, is there, is this one of your favorite, well, you said it was one of your favorites, but is there, is there any other ones that you recommend that are sort of in this vein? So, yeah. So it, just in case nobody, so in the world of curious. folk horror, um, folk, like folk mm-hmm. horror was, um, a big, it had it had its kind of small time in the sixties and seventies in, in British horror. Um, it didn't um, really last that long, and obviously worldwide, there's tons of interest in folk horror. But widely, it, there's, there's widely considered to be like three standout ones from the British um, era. One is The Wicker Man, obviously. The second one mm-hmm. is a film called Witchfinder General from 1968, which stars Vincent Price, and is set in like the plague era, and it's about. Um, Vincent Price playing um, a man whose task it is to hunt down witches. And that's a very interesting folk horror from 68. And then there's a film called The Blood on Satan's Claw from, I think, 1971, which is... Mm, That's on my list. Yeah, and that's another Uh really good folk horror. And they're like the trilogy of great British folk horror films. Although I have to say The Wicker Man for me is above and beyond, you know, all of them. And indeed, pretty much like almost all horror i would say it's one of the the finest horror films or or the very least one of my personal favorite horror films um beyond you know the vast majority Mm -hmm. of it and i would say in the canon of british horror i think wicker man and don't look now are the two that stand brightest and stand stand above the rest um you know and ironically, they were they were made when British horror was on the decline and when British horror was kind of ending. Like the peak was the sixties, and but but they came along right at the back end, and they were better than what had come before. That's excellent, and I I really I am so appreciative of seeing this film at this point in my life too because. I am sort of on this trajectory where 
I'm taking in new information that I feel like is helping me so much mm-hmm. that I want to share, which is why I'm even doing this series is like, it's sort of a, a catharsis in a way of me to say, okay, what are the things that I'm learning and how can I share them? And now I have this image of Howie in my mind of like, the the way not to do this yeah. uh and, and the way to to, to sort of go, go about this because i i just think um it's so it's so important not just uh what we're passionate about but how how we're passionate about it because the saddest thing the, the greatest tragedy would be to love something so much and people completely have no access to you and 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 your way of of trying to to express it is so alienating and so rejected. Um, I, I just can't think of anything um, more sad than that. And I think that Howie's cry at the end is that he's just like yelling into the to the abyss, yep. and there's just no reception whatsoever. So that's my that's my biggest takeaway from this movie: an unlikely spot to sort of feel uh, inspired. Uh, quite frankly, but I will remember these characters and I'm really grateful to you for adding so much rich context to it as well. Not just the meaning of it, but also just the the way in which it was sort of come about. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Like so. I, I love this film so much and it has meant a lot to me for a very long time. I first saw it as a teenager and it made a huge impact on me at the time. Mm. And the more I watch it, the more I find stuff like you're talking about, about the way that we go through our lives and the way that we interact with people and how pointless it can be to be to to commit to something and to not accept others and to take that to like an absolute extreme and yeah i you know it's, it's why it's part of why the film means a lot to me and always will and i really appreciate this conversation it's been you know incredibly um, interesting and then like it's been a pleasure enlightening yeah thank you so much darren and uh everybody else see you at the movies